Um, all right, well, this is the second part. For those of you who were not here last week, we are basically looking at three silos of, of information. Those silos are as follows. The, the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines, um, as written down by the founding fathers of our, uh, of our faith, uh, James White, Ellen White, Uriah Smith, uh, Jones and Wagner, et cetera, et cetera. And the other silo of the, of the Holy Bible, which in of itself is, is sort of a, um, a Byzantine collection for those looking on the outside of different books written by different authors over many, many thousands of years. And, and the, basically the knowledge of the Holy Bible, and then science. So you can see here very clearly that some people like Richard Dawkins would be firmly over here in the red part of science and not think that there is any truth in these two silos, right? Whereas there may be people, for instance, Southern Baptists, who would like, like for instance, Ham, who, bro who built the uh, Noah's Ark, who would feel that he's squarely right here where science and the Holy Bible agree, maybe not, maybe not necessarily uh, knowing or, or even agreeing with some of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines. And my goal at the outset of this was to combine all three of these, because if, if it is true, if in fact that the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines were inspired by the Holy Spirit, which came from God, and is the same Spirit that inspired the writers of the Holy Bible, and was the Spirit, in fact, of Jesus Christ, who created the earth in six days, then in fact, we should be right here in the middle of all this, in the white. And we should be able to find something that would bring all of those things together, a signature, as you will. And that's where the presentation name come from, which was SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We have whole organizations and, and data that is being used to collect uh, data from, from outer space looking for patterns to see if there is intelligent life somewhere out there. And the question is, is what is the key to this? And we talked about last time that in fact there is a key, um, and that key we went through last time. Basically, you know, what I tried to show is that we could merge the blue and the green circle together because what we were able to do is use the, the special key, which is the sanctuary, to bring those together. And here's a couple of, of quotes. This is where I started out in terms of studying this. The correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. It's the foundation. The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as brought to light the position and work of his people. And that's Great Controversy 423. And so what we did was we used that sanctuary, and here it is in Psalm 77. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all. Keyword there is all thy work and talk to thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is the greater God is our God. So it looks like the evidence is there to say that if God works his way through the sanctuary, perhaps there are other things that he works through or uh, he works through the sanctuary to do other things. For instance, we looked at Christ's mission in history and it was in the form of a sanctuary. The individual way of salvation is through the sanctuary, right? If you go through all of those pieces of furniture. We found that in John 1, there was a hidden sanctuary that we went through. That the 23rd Psalm is arranged in the form of a sanctuary. That the Lord's Prayer is actually arranged in the form of a sanctuary. That the children of Israel marched through Egypt and went to the, we'll wait for her to get up there, all right. Um, that, that they went to the promised land in the form of a sanctuary. That in fact, many Passovers, in fact, all of the Passovers, I don't have enough time to go through them, but if you look at every single Passover in the Bible, it is arranged in the form of a sanctuary. There is justification first, circumcision. Then there is sanctification, getting rid of the leaven out of the house. And then there is finally glorification, which begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is seven days. And in all of these, we looked at Egypt, we looked at Lot and Sodom, we looked at Joshua and Jericho, and all of these things lined up one on top of the other like we were 3D printing, okay? And remember, all of these are written by different people at different times about different places, and yet they all follow the same pattern. We talked about Judah and Tamar, how that followed in a sanctuary way. We talked about Revelation 12, how it begins with the, 
the bride who is pregnant and how that fit in terms of the, the Jewish wedding and how that fits perfectly in with this, with this uh, schema or this construct of the, uh, of the uh, sanctuary. We also showed how Esther, the story of Esther, which is, <clears throat> let's face it, it was probably one of the books of the Bible that didn't, almost didn't make it into the canon. The Essenes didn't transcribe it. Um, Martin Luther, speaking of Martin Luther, felt that there was nothing redeeming in it and would prefer to have it tossed out of the canon. Yet, if you look at how Esther goes through and saves her people, it is exactly in the form of a sanctuary and it mirrors perfectly the Adventist eschatological version of prophecy. Specifically looking, and if you, just, just to remind you, she goes into the king, into the throne room, symbolizing 1844, and the very next thing that happens after the banquet, which symbolizes judgment, is the books are opened and people who are not rewarded are rewarded. Uh, it's, it's too, these are so many coincidences. The Reformation, speaking of the Reformation that started uh, more than 500 years ago, the reformers went through each one of those positions on the sanctuary, redeeming those positions and those, those, um, those doctrines. For instance, Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith alone. That was the altar of sacrifice. John Calvin was famous for saying, man shall not pray to man, but man to God. And that re resurrected the doctrine of going boldly before the throne and praying to God for forgiveness of sins. That's the altar of incense. So there's, and there's many, many more. That, uh, there's a number of Passovers that I didn't even mention that we could talk about. They're, they're amazing, but we don't have much time. So the sanctuary, I believe, is the key. And that's where we left it off last time. And so now what we're trying to do is we're trying to merge this formally merged circle with that of science. That would be, I think, the piece de la resistance. This would be the holy grail. If we could look into science and find the sanctuary. And, and I'll tell you, we're, we're going to dabble a little bit around the edge, and then right at the end, we're going to go and hit it full force. And the amazing thing is, is that the sanctuary has been hiding in science in plain sight for years. And we haven't seen it. You're going to see it today. Okay? And when you see it, you're going to be like, no way. No way. So the first thing is, let's talk about mathematics and numbers. So this is something that I've come across in the Bible. Uh, not just me, many other people have noticed it. Numbers recur. Have you ever noticed how 500 people die in the Bible? It's never 497. It's always 500. How many people died when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments and refused to follow God? How many people died on that day? 3,000, about 3,000 it says, correct? And that was the day that the Ten Commandments were given to the people. That's also known as what? The day of Pentecost. That's Pentecost, that's 50 days after the Passover. When the Holy Spirit came down, for instance, after Jesus Christ died on the cross on the day of Pentecost, how many were translated in that one day? 3,000. 3, Isn't that amazing? Why, on the same day, separated, same number. So there's 12 disciples, there's 12 tribes of Israel. You cannot tell me that numbers don't mean things in the Bible. They're not just there for historical reasons. I believe that they are historically correct, but I believe that they actually have a meaning. When number one is used, it usually refers to the Godhead. When two, it usually means a union or unity. Three represents the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna give a backup for all of these things, but I'm letting you know. Three is the Holy Spirit, it's the third member of the Godhead. Four represents the whole earth, the four corners of the earth. Remember that when, when um, Alexander the Great fell, he divided his kingdom into the four generals. Grace is associated with number five, we'll go through that. Man is number six, obviously six man was, was created on the sixth day. The, 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 the name of the, the, of the man, his number is 666. Uh, completeness is seven, there are seven days in a week. Jesus represents eight. You probably didn't realize that, did you? We'll talk about that. The commandments and then the church. So let's talk about this in terms of grace. And the reason why I'm introducing you to this is because it'll make sense later on. So if you think about these things, this five keeps appearing over and over again. When Jesus fed the multitude, how many multitude did he feed? 5,000. And they were, all, they were all Jews, and he, gave it, they didn't, he just gave it to them. It was grace. Okay? And how many loaves did he use to feed them? Five. 
Okay? When Abraham was bargaining with God about how many righteous he would need to have to save Sodom and Gomorrah, what number did he start off with? 50. And what did he work down by? Five. I think that's interesting. Um, when we go to Simon's feast, and remember uh, Simon said, you know, Jesus, if you knew who that woman was, you wouldn't even allow her to be even touching you, right? And so Christ turns to Simon and tries to give him a parable about, you know, I forgive one man 500, I forgive the other man 50, who's gonna love, the man, who's gonna love me more? So that's grace. He's talking about grace, and what numbers is he using? 500 and 50. In the altar of, uh, sorry, in the sanctuary, the altar of sacrifice represents the lamb dying on the cross. What are the dimensions of the altar of sacrifice? Five cubits by five cubits, okay? And um, when on one, of the, on one of the Passovers, Christ goes up to the pool of Bethesda and he heals a man and he doesn't even ask him to have faith in him, right? He just heals him. He says, do you want to be well? Yes, get up. He gets up. That's grace. If you read in, in uh, Christ's Object Lessons, or maybe it's Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, here was a man who rep basically represented sinful humanity. There was no way this man could get up on his own to make it to the pool to make him be healed. So he represents our condition. And Christ comes and basically heals him right there. It's very interesting. It, it seems like it's completely unrelated, but when you read the, the text, it talks about how many porticos were at the pool of Bethesda. It just, put, just puts that in. How many, how many porticos, how many roofs were at the pool of Bethesda? Five. Do you know that they've actually unearthed the pool of Bethesda? It's actually a large, it's like a large rectangle with a, so it's a portico going all the way around so people could be in the shade, and then there's one going right down the middle, so it looks like an eight. And they counted that one, two, three, four, five. Five porticos. So we know that it was true. Um, how many, well, the Holy Spirit was given by grace, correct? How many days after the, the Passover was it given? 50. So you see this number over and over again. Five always represents a gift from God. It's grace. Okay? What about eight? So Jesus represents our sacrifice. What day was Jesus named Jesus? He was named Jesus, it says in the Bible, on the eighth day. Now all of the, the young boys were circumcised on the eighth day. Why? Why were they circumcised in the first place? Well, it was after the tradition of Abraham. Abraham was circumcised. Not to get a little bit graphic here, but uh, remember Abraham thought that he was going to solve the problem of having a baby by doing his own work, correct? He did it by himself, right? Without God's grace. So that's salvation by works. And so the purpose of circumcision was to remind Abraham that this is not gonna happen by your own works. It's gonna happen by the grace of God. And that is Jesus Christ. So circumcision is, is Jesus Christ. And on what day are all the little babies circumcised? On the eighth day. How many people were in the ark? So Jesus Christ represents completion of the old and the beginning of the new. So here we have a new start. How many people are in the ark? Eight. On what day did Jesus rise from the dead? On the eighth day. Okay. Um, when Jesus comes back and starts the new millennium, that will be after the end of the 7,000 years, correct? And that will be at the beginning of the eighth millennium. Uh, how about an octave? When you play an octave, so here's, here's music coming in. We have just taken two frequencies, one is twice the other, and we've arbitrarily divided that into eight. And that's music, that's Western music. The eighth note begins the scale, it ends the scale, but it's also the beginning of the next scale, right? And that's something that's intuitive to our brain. Music is intuitive to our brain. <clears throat> what about the numeric value of the name Jesus in Greek? If you take the name Jesus and add up what the numbers mean, he adds up to 888, okay? So Jesus represents eight, or the number eight. What about three? We talked about the Holy Spirit. Well, there's this really interesting thing. If you're reading in the Bible, and the, and the atheists love to bring this up, they say that the Bible is not a reliable source. And the reason why they say it's not a reliable source is because of these two texts, 1 Kings 7.26 and 2 Chronicles 4.5. And if you go there, 
what's to, what is being described is the temple, Solomon's temple. And there's, you know, the laver is in the outer court. Well, in the outer court, they called it the Bronzen Sea. It was this massive, huge golden con- or bronze container filled with water. Well, if you go to 1 Kings, it says that it held 2,000 baths. A bath was a, uh, a volume measurement in Hebrews and at the time, and it said that it contained 2,000. Um, if you go to 2 Chronicles, however, it says there that it could receive and hold 3,000. So why would it say that? Is that, a, is that a contradiction? No, the feeling was is that, as you know with any, anyone who has a swimming pool, there's a certain amount of water that can fit in your pool normally, right? But if you filled it all the way up to the brim so that it was about to overflow, that would be a, a different amount. Well, it's felt that that's what's going on here in 1 Kings 7.26 and 2 Chronicles 4.5. What's interesting about this is here is a single container that can normally hold two, but in times of, let's say, the latter rain, or when there's an abundance of rain, it fills all the way up to 3,000. So there's two situations, there's two binary codes here. There is the normal situation, two, and there is the unusual situation where there's an outpouring of rain, three. What does the outpouring of rain symbolize? The Holy Spirit. And so how many times in scripture do we see this used? Two or three? How many people threw Jezebel over the tower? Here's, the Bible is so accurate in its description. You're telling me that it can't tell how many people threw Jezebel over the tower? Remember Jehu comes up to the tower and says, who is on my side? And it says in the Bible, and two or three of them threw Jezebel over the tower. God is in the presence of them where, wherever there's two or three. Why don't I just say two? Right, because if you've got three, you've got two. So what does this mean, this two or three? Well, the, this thing called a bath is the Hebrew version of what's written in the, in the New Testament called the firkin. Okay, so think about this. When you start looking at these numbers and saying, okay, this number means this and this number means that, you get some very interesting things that occur. 3,000 were converted a day on Pentecost, the third member of the Godhead. 3,000 died when the Holy Spirit was rejected at Sinai. Remember when Mary Magdalene w- broke the alabaster jar <coughs> and was uh, anointing Christ? Um, it says in L- Ella White, she says that specifically she did not know what she was doing. It was the Holy Spirit that was guiding her to do this. Okay? And do you know how much the, the, uh, the alabaster jar and the spike jar was worth, according to the gospel? 300 denarii. So again, another example of how this is working through. So man is six. Man was created on the sixth day. Man would work for six days. 666 is the number of a man. There are six pieces of furniture in the sanctuary, total, designed to save man. Christ pierced in six places for man, right? So there's one, two on the feet, three, four on the hands. There's the crown of thorns. And then remember, he was pierced here. And what came out? Remember that for later. And then man loses dominion to Lucifer for 6,000 years. Okay, so there it is. So some interesting things come up. Remember we talked about how we had the sanctuary here. We had justification, we had sanctification, and we had glorification here. And we said that these were synonymous with the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th of the Passover. Well, if you look at this, it's really interesting. Here on the 13th, we see Jesus' grace, correct? What's the number for Jesus? What's the number for grace? What's eight plus five? Okay, here we see Jesus' spirit working through man. This is when the latter rain comes into man. This is when man becomes perfected. This is sanctification. So we see Jesus working through man. What's the number for Jesus? Eight, what's the number for man? What's eight plus six? 14. Here, Jesus throws down the censer at the close of probation. He's finished his ministry in the sanctuary. He's now coming back to redeem his kingdom, to marry his bride, to claim the body of Christ. 
What's the number for Jesus? Eight, and his work is complete. Seven, 15. You start to see these numbers starting to come together in some, some interesting way. <laughs> I like this one. Remember the wedding at Cana? What did, this is the wedding feast. According to our schemata of the, of the three C's of a Jewish wedding, we have the, we have the, um, the um, covenant, and then we have the consummation, and then the last thing that happens after the close of probation is what? After the consummation is the celebration. It's the wedding feasts. People getting together and having a wedding feast. Remember the wedding feast at Cana. How many water pots were there? Six water pots. What do you think that meant? Already you know what the water pots represent. What did the water pots represent? Man, okay? And notice in the text it says that they were used for the purification of the Jews. That's what it says in John 2. Guess how many firkins each one holds? I mean, they were so explicit and so specific. Are you telling me, does it hold two or does it hold three? It should hold, does it hold two or does it hold three? Again, this is another analogy. It's, it's taking you back to where? It's taking you back to that bronze and sea in, in Solomon's temple. It can hold 2,000 or it holds 3,000 when there is an abundance of rain, correct? Okay, and Jesus turns them into wine, representing his blood. And the governor of feast says he saved the best to last. So what does this represent? This represents the 144,000. Watch this, six water pots, and how, how much did they fill it? Did they fill it halfway? Each water pot holds between two and three firkins and they filled it all the way to the brim, it says in the Bible, right? So therefore, how many firkins were in each pot? Three. So six water pots times three firkins times Jesus' miracle. Man, so what, does the whole, what, what is the equation for the 144,000? It's man time, times the Holy Spirit pulled out, poured out in full times Jesus' blood. Essentially, six times 3,000 times eight. What does that equal? 144,000. So these numbers just keep coming up. And yet, they're coming from different parts of the Bible, different authors, and we can see them. We're not gonna get to this, but think about this. Jesus, I'm gonna put a little seed in your head. Jesus requires Jesus is the basis for all salvation, correct? Correct? Okay, just remember that. Just remember that. You're gonna be st All right, let's go to physics. Oh boy, can I do physics? This is gonna be interesting. How many of you looked at the videos that we um, linked to on the advertisement? Okay, <laughs> this is gonna blow your minds, okay? I didn't even realize this. So this is Isaac Newton. And everyone thinks about Isaac Newton when it comes time to study physics in high school. But in fact, Isaac Newton wrote more about prophecy than he did about physics. And he was actually knighted. He says, the prophecies of Daniel are all of them related to one another, as if they were but several parts of one general prophecy given at several times. This guy is smart. The first is the easiest to be understood, and every following prophecy adds something new to the former. Isn't that what we've just seen? This guy was a genius. Okay, so in the sanctuary, you will notice that there is much use of light. If you were to go into the holy place, imagine four walls completely covered in gold and a seven-branch candlestick in the middle of all of that. It's gonna be very bright. Now imagine going into the most holy place where the Shekinah glory is. Half the size of a room with a, with a, a light that cannot be bared if there is any sin in you. Otherwise it would burn you, okay? Light, what, what, how important was light in God's creation? It's the first thing he did. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what scientists today are discovering about light. And then what we're gonna do is compare what we know about light today, in science, today. And I'm gonna to go to the Bible and see, see if there's a correlation. Have any of you heard of the double slit experiment? Okay, let's see if I can explain this correctly. You shine, you shine particles, well, let me back up. <laughs> Already I've made a mistake. Because light is both a particle and a wave, okay? 
So at first they decided that light was a wave. Young uh, did this experiment 200 years ago and says light is a wave. And then Einstein came up and said, no, it's, it's a particle uh, because it has all of the properties of a particle. Watch this. So you shine particles of light, or any particle for, it, for it, that matter, through two slits. If, if it is a wave, the waves will, will interfere with each other, the troughs will meet the peaks, and they will cancel each other out. And then the troughs and the troughs will meet, and the peaks and the peaks will meet. Okay? And what you'll get is something called an interference pattern. That is an interference pattern. Okay? If I took spray paint and sprayed paint through here, each of those are particles. They would reach the other side and you would have two strips. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? So which one would it be? Well, what they did is they took light and they shone it through. They, they took actually photons of light and they put it through two slits. And what came out on the other side was an interference pattern. So they said, aha, light must be a wave. But they said, well, that's interesting. How is that happening? Are they interacting with each other? So they said, let's do it again. Let's do a different experiment. Let's take a photon gun and shoot a particle one at a time. One at a time. So they cannot interact with each other. And they, they did it for a number of hours and they waited to develop the screen on the other side. And guess what they found? They found an interference pattern. So, and the wave equation, there was a graduate student by the name of Schrodinger who came up with the cat in the box and all that kind of stuff. I took a little bit of chemistry. I think you took a little bit of chemistry in college. We'd have to do quantum mechanics. That was like the, the most bizarre quarter of, of, of our college career because nothing made sense. It was not intuitive. Schrodinger came up with these wave equations and the wave equations were mathematically, they didn't make sense, but mathematically it said that the particle goes through both slits it goes through neither slits, and it goes through one slit and then the other slit, all at the same time, one particle. And what happened was when they were done shooting the particles, you had an interference pattern. That's the first bizarre thing that happened, okay? The second bizarre thing that happened was, okay, which, we wanna know which slit it's going through. So they set up a detector next to one of the slits. So it could tell, if there's a particle going past it. So they put up the detector, everything else stayed the same. And they ran the experiment. Six hours later, they pulled it, they developed it, and you know what they found? They, they did not find an interference pattern, they found this pattern. The light behaved completely differently because the detector was looking. This completely astounded, it gets even, it gets even weirder. Okay, gets even weirder. So this is, this is the waves, they're going through. They go through here and you get this interference pattern. Okay, that's what normally happens with waves. This is what the interference pattern look like with waves, okay? This is what it looks like with the interference pattern. Without any detectors, this is what you got. As soon as they put a detector by the slit, this is what they got. For the first time, we could demonstrate that the foundation of science was flawed. The foundation of science has always been that observing something doesn't change it. And now we've just shown that by observing something, it actually changes it. Or, or something happens. The relationship between the observed and the observer changes physics. Because now no longer are we getting an interference pattern. You, you, know, what, you know what they did? They, they hooked these detectors up to one of these tape machines. They did this back in the 20s. And when they hooked it up, what was, what was required was a brain, a human brain, to be able to say the photon went through this path or it went through that path. If you could say that the photon went through a specific path, it would do this. As soon as you took that, took that away and you had ambiguity, it would look like this. When they, when they, all they did was they just flipped off the tape machine. As soon as they flipped off the tape machine, it went from this to this. How is that possible? How does a photon of light know if you're looking at it? But this is the truth. This is exactly what happened. This is called 
The grand paradox of quantum mechanics is the double slit experiment. Now we're going to get really crazy. So this is, a, this is a paper that was published back in 2000. This is how just recent we're talking this has come to light. No pun intended, okay? Again, the key is knowing which slit it went through. If you know the slit that it goes through, it behaves as a particle. The wave function collapses down and it behaves as a particle. If you don't know, if you don't believe, I'm trying to move ahead here. If you don't believe, if you don't look at the light, if you don't study the light, if you don't look at it, it's now a diffuse probability wave distribution. That's light. As soon as you look at the light, it now collapses down into a particle that has momentum. Okay? So let me see if I can explain this. This is, I don't know if I could even explain it because I don't know if I understand it. Here is the lit, here's the, the, light, the, the light coming through. There's two slits. There's a red slit and there is a blue slit. Now watch this. This is something called a barium boron, boron what is it? Barium borate. borate, thank you. And what this does is something incredible. It actually takes a photon and it causes two photons to be created, okay, with half the energy of both. So in other words, you have energy of x, now this has energy of x divided by two, so therefore it's twice the wavelength. Those of you who know physics, right? The longer the wavelength, the less energy. So these are entangled. They must act the same. They're called entangled photons. They have opposite spins. They have different angular momentum. This has to happen because you, you have to have conservation of angular momentum whenever you have some of these things happen. But notice this. We have detectors here. D0, D3, D1, D2, D4. This is a prism. This is a lens that converges. This is a prism that diverges. These are 50% coated with silver, so they let 50% of the photons go through them, and they let 50% be reflected. Here's the key point. Notice here that if I see, if I have photons here, okay, let's say that a photon goes through this one here. It's gonna go, it's gonna definitely hit this detector, and it's gonna go here, and it's, and it's going to hit this detector some of the time, but it's going to be reflected down here, and it's going to hit this detector, okay? I want you to notice something. Some of these detectors have both red and blue hitting it. This one has red and blue hitting it. This one has just red hitting it. This one has just blue hitting it. And this one has both red and blue. The point is, is that if I pick up a photon at these places that only have red or blue hitting it, I will know which slit it went through. If I know which slit it went through, how is it going to behave? It's going to collapse down like a particle. On the other hand, if I have these detectors here and it comes here and there's two, I don't know which slit it went through. It's going to behave as a interference pattern. Right? And check this out. So they did this coincidence counter where they basically measure whatever hits this and hits this, and this is what they found. Notice the interference pattern on R1 and R2, okay? So D1 and D2 is an interference pattern. Why? Because two of them are hitting it. Whereas over here on R3 and R4, here and here, it behaves as a collapsed particle. The wave function has collapsed. Now, you say, okay, what's so special about that? Well, watch what's so special about it. If we take this one, for example, this one goes here. Let's say that a photon goes through here. And it goes here, and it goes here, and it hits D4. And the other entangled one goes to the lens and hits D0. Check this out. The path for D4 is longer than the path for D0, which means that the photon knew that it was being detected and, could, and the path could be figured out after its entangled pair had already hit the detector. The entangled pair had already hit the detector before the other one could be used to figure out what the path was. Does that make sense? Which means that there was foreknowledge that the photon was going to be detected and it behaved appropriately at the detector D0. That is completely goes against anything that we know scientifically. How does the, the photon not only knows 
that it's going to be looked at, but it knows before it's looked at, and it behaves in a different way. This is, this is reality. This is what science is showing. This is light. Okay? This is light. This is how light behaves. They are now using this in something called quantum computers. Have you heard of quantum computers? Instead of bits, you know what they're called? Qubits. Qubits. I think it's interesting because what do we measure the sanctuary in? Qubits. They're actually now, do you know when you encrypt stuff, do you know why no one can break into it? Because it would take the fastest computer a million or billion years to go through all the computations to be able to figure out what the code is. One of these computers could do it in two seconds. And they're developing these computers as we speak. These, this, um, this entangled pair, when you know Let's talk about angular momentum. If you know the angular momentum, this is crazy stuff. It took me like a month to just digest this stuff. If you have two entangled photons and the spin of one is down, the other spin has to be up because the addition of the two angular momentums have to cancel each other out, right? Do you know that if someone is a million or a million miles away, that as soon as the angular momentum of one is known, the other one goes to the other side? at the same moment. In other words, information travels faster than the speed of light. Is that a potential way that Christ, if we are entangled in the light, that he would be able to hear our prayers even though he's several hundreds of millions of light years away? So this is an actual, this is actual science. Okay, this is not, so let's look at light. There's a couple of things that come across from these experiments. The first thing is that looking at the light changes the relationship between the observer and the observed. It's a which path determination. If you know the path, if you can figure out what the path is, it goes from an interference pattern to a, to a definite particle. Number two, not looking at the light leaves light as a probability equation with wave-like properties. So you don't know where it's coming from and you don't know where it's going, okay? Light takes on the characteristics of a particle and not a wave when it is observed. And this occurs with foreknowledge. Before the observation occurs, it has already behaved in the way that it should be behaving before the observation actually takes place. This is, this is scientific fact. If I was presenting this to a bunch of scientists, they'd say I was crazy. But they're the ones that are going to be presenting this to you because this is actual scientific fact. And the experiments prove it that entangled photons can transmit information faster than the speed of light. You, once you know the momentum of one, you know ex immediately what the, um, what the other one is, and it actually behaves in that way, even though they're, Einstein called this spooky, what do you call it? He called it spooky action at a distance, right? This is what Einstein called it. They knew this in the 1920s, 1930s. They knew all of this. Spooky action at a distance. Okay, now, We've only learned this in the last century. Now let's go to the Bible. Should this be a surprise to the Holy Spirit? Should the Holy Spirit be waking up and saying, wow, I had no idea this is how light behaved? Let's see. Let's see if we see those same characteristics in light. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and give it light unto all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may, it's not enough just to have the light shining. Someone's gotta see it. Someone's gotta see it. How about John 1? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the light shineth in darkness, and look, the darkness comprehended it not. It's a wave function. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that, that through him he might. Do you see this witnessing and believing go hand in hand? Someone's got to be looking at the light. This was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. But watch this. But as, as many has received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In other words, the light's there for everybody. But you've got to look at the light to get the benefit of the light. And that's the way it works in quantum mechanics as well. Uh, John chapter 8. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. 
Now, when Christ says, I'm, I'm like the light, you can take that analogy really far. I've noticed. Anytime Christ says something, you just keep taking that analogy out to the nth degree and you're probably going to be right. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Check this out. Check this out. Jesus is the one that created light. Now watch what he says. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. He knows the path. Particle. But ye cannot tell whence I came and whither I go. That's exactly, that describes exactly the double slit experiment. If you don't know Christ, he's just the probability wave equation. This, this would not make sense outside of quantum mechanics. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it under a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may. It's all about seeing the light. Now watch this. The light of the body is the eye. This is the very thing that you need in quantum mechanics to make the change from wave to particle. Therefore, when, the, when thine eye is good, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thy eye is evil, thy body is also full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Are you telling me that how you end up has nothing to do with the wave function, it has to do with looking at the light. We are changed by observing. It's amazing. We also have a more sure word of the prophecy, where unto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Again, here's this example of it's the light plus the observer. Again, walketh in darkness, knowing not where, whether he goeth. While he have light, believe in the light. Here we go. Believe. It's faith. That ye may be the children of light. Could it be that observing Christ as the light of the earth and setting up a detector means faith? And that when we have faith in Christ, something some I, I don't really know if this is just a really good analogy or if this is actually what happens. But this is, what, this is how light behaves at the quantum level. Okay? And how would these writers know to speak like this? He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes. Wave function. Nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. Th these things go on. I am the light that comes into the world. Whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. There is a faith aspect to this. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness. Wave function. Neither shadow of turning. I saw that wisdom excelleth folly and as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happened to them all. Wow. So you're telling me that the light can shine for both. But if one decides not to look, it's a wave function for them. But if someone decides to look, it's a particle. It's right here. Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I think they had an understanding at that time about quantum mechanics. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know what is of the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. <clears throat> and, the, and these just go on and on. Here's Acts 26. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light that dwells with them. As, I am, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay? That's what he said to the guy right before he healed him. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva, and then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and... See how he coupled these two things? Light, seeing. Those two things have to happen. You have to have light, and you have to have someone seeing it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. 
and it shall come to pass that before they will call, check this out. And it shall come to pass that before they will call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Could, could it be that when we are with Christ, we are entangled, and that our very thoughts, he knows? There's a physical basis for that now. You could say before, what, do prayers travel faster than the speed of light? That's impossible. Well, at least the scientists now are saying it's not impossible. Information can travel faster than the speed of light. In fact, it's instantaneous. As you are yet speaking. Romans 8, 29, 30. For whom, now check this out. Remember we said that here's the entangled photons. It gets to one detector. It gets to the other detector after it. The detector that it gets to afterwards causes us to know which path it was taking. Therefore, it should not behave as a interference pattern. It should behave as a particle. It already hits the, the first detector before we get a chance to see what path it's on. When we go back and look, it behaved perfectly knowing that we were going to look at the other detector before it hit the detector. Foreknowledge. What does is, what is Romans 8.29 say? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be confirmed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called them. He also justified, and whom he justified them, he also glorified. All of that, exactly. You see the sanctuary there. Okay, what about Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy? What does she say? She says, yeah, I agree. The light of the body is the eye. If, the, if the, therefore the eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. She's just quoting Matthew 6.22. What does she say? She says, these words have a first and second sense. A literal and a figurative meaning. They are full of truth in regard to the bodily eye, which we see external objects. They are also true in regards to the spiritual eye, the conscience, which we estimate good and evil, human perceptions, eye of the mind. Amazing. But without the eye of faith, he cannot see the treasure. So she understands it's the eye that gives us that clarity. Okay. All right, now for the, for the big... So we showed how mathematics, and we showed how this. Now, how is it possible... Okay, this is, this is mind-blowing when you think about this. Let's take... What is, what is the Lord's crowning creation? Man. Now, when I say man, from now on I mean man and woman, okay? Because it says that he created them both man and woman in his image. Wouldn't it be just amazing if he put the sanctuary smack dab right in the middle of his creation called man? Check this out. Okay, let's, let's build on this, the body of Christ. We already showed in the last lecture how the bride of Christ is the church, right? What happens though when a man and a woman consummate a marriage? What does it say? They are now what? So, if the bride of Christ is the church, is now the body of Christ the church? Yes. That's why you see it referred to. The church is both the body of Christ and it's both the bride of Christ. It's all the same. They are now one. This is the reason why a man leaves his father, right? With the text? Okay. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall twain and be what? One flesh. It's the same. There's no difference. What God had joined together, let no man put asunder. So the church equals Christ's bride, but the church is also the body of Christ at the same time. So Christ's bride is the body of Christ. Let's go through this. There's a lot of these quotes. So, 1 Corinthians 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Here we're going to get an anatomy lesson. Okay? Because the body, let's think about this. The church is the bride of Christ, and the bride of Christ is also the body of Christ, and was Christ the man? So man's body must be the church. So let's get an anatomy lesson. For the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being as many are one body, so also is Christ. For by, by one spirit, we are all baptized into what? One body. 
whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and whether we have been made all to drink unto one spirit. For the body is not one member, but how many? Many. Get ready. This is going to be cool. And it talks about the foot in the air. One body, right? So, so different people represent different parts of that body. Again, it goes on. No schism in the body. All the members rejoice with it. Now you're a body of Christ and members in particular. We could read into depth and we get a lot more meaning, but in the interest of time, we've got to move. There is one body, one spirit, as you've been called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Remember that quote for later. For the edifying of the body of Christ, perfect man, for whom the body fit jointly together, compacted with every joint supplieth according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase in the body into the edifying into itself love, itself in love. Being many are one body in Christ and every one member of one another, Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. I mean, this is clear as day, okay? Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. So in other words, is the Lord going to be inhabiting this body? If anybody should know this, it should be us, right? This is the reason why we have the health message. Correct? Okay, we're here at Loma Linda. We're in a blue zone. We should know all this. In whom you're also built it together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Tell me, what part of the sanctuary did God dwell in? The tent of meeting. That inner part, okay? Let's, let's keep going here. He's also the head of the body, the church. Gave him his head over all things to the church. This is one that's been tossed around a lot. Let's just re remind ourselves, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Baptized into Christ. We're baptized into one body, we're baptized into Christ. That body must be the body of Christ. This is just simple logic, right? The whom the entire body being supplied. I think you guys are getting the, uh, the, the, the idea here is not the cup of blessing, which is blessing and sharing in the blood of Christ. We're sharing in the blood of Christ. Are you guys getting this? Are you, are you seeing where we're going with this? There's one body. Let me just make the jump. Is there one circulation system? Are all the cells benefiting from that circulation system? What is the purpose of that circulation system? To give oxygen to the cells, right? What's the atomic number of oxygen? Uh, Atomic oxygen. Eight, isn't it? What did Christ do to Adam to make him a living soul? He breathed into him, right? Eight? You're telling me that eight is the, uh, is the atomic number of oxygen? What's the atomic number of carbon? Six. Six. And we are a carbon-based life form. It's interesting how these numbers are fitting together. Um, since there is one bread, we who are many... Are, Let's get, to, let's get to the bottom line here. So number one, the church is the bride of Christ, is the body of Christ. They all share in one blood. They all share in one baptism with water. We all make up different parts of the same body. God dwells in us like a temple. The law will be written inside of each of us. That's Hebrews 10. Did I skip that? I did. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I will put my what? Laws into their hearts and into their minds will I write them. This is all written before 70 AD, okay? Think about this. The human circulatory system was not yet discovered, or if it was, I'm certainly sure John didn't know about it. Maybe Luke did, he was an actual physician, so he might have known something about it. Had cells been discovered? Had DNA been discovered? Well, we can certainly say that for Ellen White. Ellen White wrote at a time where there was no DNA. We didn't know what DNA was. Man is a living sanctuary, not just Theologically. I just pulled this off the internet. I just pulled that right off the internet. This is a slide, a medical slide, describing the body compartments, the fluid body compartments. What's the first fluid compartment of the body? It's the plasma. And what does the plasma hold? Blood. Blood. Then you move from the plasma into the extracellular space. That's water. We are baptized with one blood and water. When Christ hung on the cross and the sword went in, what came out? Every single one of us 
in the body of Christ is given nutrients by the blood of Christ, literally, in that typology. And we were baptized, every single cell is in an extracellular environment. That's just human anatomy. That's just basic human anatomy. And then what happens is you move into a chamber that is divided into an inner chamber and an outer chamber. The nucleus and the cytosol. We, we literally are sanctuaries. And each cell, just as there are multiple, just as there are 37 trillion cells in a single body, there are many members of the body of Christ that make up this. This is the Bible saying this, right? I'm not saying it, the Bible's saying it. The cytosol has ribosomes and organelles. What about the nucleus? It's got DNA and the nucleolus. Jesus and God reside in the most holy place. Think about DNA for a bit. Think about DNA. DNA is a double helix. You have the sense strand and the anti-sense strand. The sense strand is the code that dictates everything for that cell. If there is a change in that code, what happens to the cell? It could die. That code is the law. That code is the law. That DNA is the We know of so many different diseases that occur as a result of deleterious mutations. If I get rid of one nucleotide, everything shifts. What happens to everything else? Nonsense. You break one of the commandments, you break them all. You have the sense strand and the anti-sense strand. The sense strand has the nucleotides that code so that, the, um, so that the RNA polymerase can come on and make messenger RNA. The other, the other DNA molecule simply has the complementary nucleotides. But you can tell from the complementary nucleotides what the other one was. In other words, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Right? The two tablets of stone, one is a law to how man should behave to God, and the other one, man to man. God the Father, God the Son, one is God, one is God the Son, who is fully man. If you break the law, that is sin. Sin leads to death. If you break the code, you get a mutation, that leads to cellular death. Messenger RNA is an exact replica. So messenger RNA comes on and reads the nucleotides on the sense strand. By the way, what did Jesus say about his father? I am perfectly submissive to my father. Just like the codes that run down on the anti-sense strand are perfectly submissive to the codes down the sense strand. But in any one particular nucleotide, you can flip it. One strand can now be the sense, and the other one can be the antisense. The code in the DNA is intrinsic to the DNA. The DNA, it cannot be changed. Just as the character of God, which is his law, is part of God, it cannot be changed. The messenger RNA that comes out of transcription is an exact replica of the antisense DNA. And it comes out of the nucleus into the cytosol so that it can interact with ribosomes to make protein. In other words, here is, dare I say it, here is Christ coming down and he is interacting with ribosomes, human beings, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, making the fruit of the Spirit, which is protein. You know, ribosomes cannot do this on their own. Ribosomes, ribosomes, oh, let me go back here. Ribosomes <coughs> must, so ribosomes are made out here in the cytosol. Ribosomes cannot do translation unless they have something called ribosomal RNA inside of them. They have to have ribosomal RNA. The only way they can get ribosomal RNA is if they go into the nucleolus which is the center of the nucleus. And it is there that the ribosomal RNA gets put into them. And then 
it comes back out again, and only then, with the help of the ribosomal RNA, can it guide the messenger RNA to make the protein. This is, this is scientific fact. Okay? This, is, this is how we understand it. Okay, so before the discovery of DNA, so what am I saying? That God's law is, the, is analogous to DNA. Okay, before the discovery of DNA, which was in 1950 by Franklin, or if you believe Watson and Crick, it was Watson and Crick. There's a little bit of a controversy there. This is what Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons 370, 347, 348, in 1900, 50 years before the discovery of DNA. God is as truly the author of physical laws as he is the author of the moral law. His law, his law, is written with his own finger upon every nerve, every muscle, every faculty which has been entrusted to man. How would she know that? Now, how do I know that the DNA is the law of God? How do I know that the altar of sacrifice Sorry, how do I know that the altar of incense represents prayer to God? I know that because Satan comes in and counterfeits it. He counterfeits that, and so what does he set up in the Middle Ages? There's a room with a curtain running down the middle of it with the presence of God on one side and the person on the other, and they have to pray in a counterfeit way. So Satan does all the knockoffs. He takes what he sees and he copies it. Watch this. But if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race of the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast, which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. That's a mixing of DNA. From the very beginning, Satan has accused God saying that your law is arbitrary. Your law is not good. The reason why we're having problem is because of your law. If we were to simply get rid of your law, things would be much better. This is the ribosomes, okay? <clears throat> Skip that. All right. So we know that sin is transgression, is transgression of the law. We know that the wrong existed in, this is what he says, wrong existed in heaven and in this world as the result of the law. That's what Satan says. The law is the problem. We've got to change the law, okay? It's the, but the law of God is the expression of his character. It cannot be changed. To admit that God instituted a law so imperfect in character that it needed to be changed would be a stamp to stamp God as changeable and imperfect. Is there a cell in the body that gets rid of its nucleus? Back in Noah's day, God said to Noah, I will only tend with man for so long because he is sinful. I will only tend for, with him for 120 years. There is a cell that gets rid, and they essentially got rid of their law. That's right. So what happened here is we have a cell that gets rid of its nucleus. It would be as if a cell saying, get, get, toss out the nucleus. What's the lifespan of an erythrocyte? It's 120 days. And if you look at man here, Ellen White says in the last days, when Christ comes, it will be like a jubilee year. Everything will go back to the way it normally did. That's every 50 years normally. What's 120 times 50? 6,000 years. God uses these things. Okay? Sorry about that. Here, you take a picture. Go ahead. <laughs> okay? Here are the two competing. This is how I know, and we're going to wrap up here. This is the, how I know that the law is DNA. There's two competing theories. There's this, in 1844, we became aware of the sanctuary message. In 1844, it was developed, and finally in the 1860s, that's when it went forward. Okay? But it was learned one day after the Great Disappointment is when Hiram Edson saw the vision and learned about the sanctuary. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them both, male and female. There was another theory that came about in 1844. It was a theory of evolution. Charles Darwin wrote it down in 1844. It did not get full until the 1850s or 1860s. It is the antithesis of the sanctuary message in every way. 
Because whereas the sanctuary message says that God created the cell perfect with the right DNA, and that changes to the DNA will give rise to death and destruction, evolution says that the DNA, just like Lucifer said about God's law, was imperfect. And that through changing of that law and outward pressures, the organism will move to a higher state. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Does it sound like the Garden of Eden? And do they treat this like it's a religion? Let me read to you this policy statement from the California Teachers Association. Okay? Talks about how our planet is billions of years old and life has existed on it for a large part of that time. Though the eons, the earth, and its life have changed in an unending procession of new forms and vistas. This history and mechanisms that bring about these changes are what is known as evolution. Evolution occurred in the past and is still occurring today. To fully appreciate and acquire an understanding of life on Earth, we must know a great deal about present day forms and their history. For this reason, evolution is a necessary part of everyone's education. It makes as little sense for a biology teacher to present life on Earth as a collection of static entities as it would for a social studies teacher to present civics and geography without their historical contexts. Biological evolution refers to the scientific understanding that living things share ancestors from which they have diverged. Dis descent <coughs> with modification. It is the consensus of the scientific community that evolutionary theory best explains the history of life and accounts for the similarities among living things, as well as life's diversity. As living communities profoundly affect the composition of Earth's atmosphere, weather, soils, and temperature, evolutionary theory also explains many features of the physical world in which we live. Evolutionary biology also contributes to society in more practical ways, including increased understanding of drug resistance by human pathogens, alternatives to pest controls, and use of fossil fuels and conservation. They're actually incorrect when they state that. That is not macroevolution. Teaching evolution in our science classroom is essential. As noted in the, tell me whether or not this is a dogma, a religion, or if this is science. As noted in teaching about evolution and the nature of science issued by the National Academy of Sciences, evolution pervades all biological phenomenon. Does that sound like what I said about the sanctuary? There's, there's two claims. The sanctuary pervades all, or does evolution pervade all? This is what it's boiling down to, okay? Evolution is identified as a unifying principle in the national science education standards and is integral to the California science content standards. Do you see how two systems are being set up? And they are just amazing, the analogy between the two. The California Science Teachers Association endorses the teaching of evolution at all levels of our students' education. Furthermore, we do not endorse teaching the evidence against evolution, as there is no scientific evidence that evolution has not occurred. Nor can we condone teaching scientific creationism intelligent design, or other non-scientific explanations as valid scientific theories. These beliefs ignore empirical data and fail to provide testable hypotheses. They should not be a part of the science curriculum. So let us hear the final conclusion and then we will end. Solomon knew about plants and animals. God showed him amazing amount of knowledge. Who knows what he actually knew? When he boiled it down at the very end, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Okay, this is the wisest man telling you, let me tell you a very pithy statement that's gonna just, this is all you need to know. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. By the way, that duty and is, is added in the King James. For this is the whole man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Let me put up the lights and we'll have a prayer and then we'll be open for questions. Dear Lord, thank you for just giving us a very brief entree into your world that you created. That you are the author of all and Satan is just copying and trying to deceive. Please help us to understand that as we go through today and, um, and help us to draw closer to you so that we may see the light. In thy name, amen. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's
It's been hiding in front of us, plain sight. How long have you been on this journey? I, you know, for the last probably three or four years, I would say 80% of that time I was stuck in the Book of Esther. I wouldn't say stuck, I was, I was digging around in the Book of Esther. And I could come back and tell you about the Book of Esther, but just like Ellen White says, one thing of ore leads to another ore and leads, I started finding all these other things. It, it, it all started at the end of Esther when I noticed that they were saved on the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. And I said, there's gotta be some meaning there. So I started investigating, what is the significance of the 13th, 14th, and 15th? And that got me to what we talked about last week. And then I said, you know, God, you're, the sanctuary, I'm seeing the sanctuary everywhere. It's probably other places. We just haven't looked for it. Um, there's, there's other sites on the internet where you can find where people have, and I, don't, I haven't researched it, but they look at the periodic table and how it fits the sanctuary, about how the, the circumference of the earth is predicted in, in Ezekiel with the, with the temple. I haven't gotten into all that, but I'm sure if we started looking at this stuff, this stuff is so powerful. I mean, you have, to be able to, to tease this apart, um, I talked to a very well-known uh, luminary in the Adventist church who believes in evolution. And he, he has heard this presentation. And I met him afterwards and he said, Roger, I'm, I'm still processing what you said. Um, because for you to, there's, there's gotta be thousands of, con of, of similarities and, and coincidences. And, and how could they all line up so well? There, there's gotta be an explanation for it. So that's how long I've been, it's, it's a, been amazing. Are you available to travel <laughs> and go to some of our schools, our I academies? Would, I would love to do that. I would love to do that because right now we're asking, um, we're asking them to believe in these things just because we said so and we're not showing them the proof of it. Um, and you know what's interesting is that this is coming at a time when I believe we're about entering into, these, into the 14th and the 15th. Um, Dr. Melashenko was, was here um, a number of months ago and I know that he talked about the science of sin. and, and what was one of the things that he talked about, I know because I've talked to him about this, is um, these, these pieces of DNA that insert themselves uh, into the DNA. And, and they are some of the basis of sin. And that would go perfectly with this. And, and we're, we're, it's like we're digging from two ends and we're meeting in the middle on that tunnel. And just, we're just basically following what we're, what we're seeing. So I think this is all coming together. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, me? Uh, I'll try to be quicker in my answers. Okay. Um, I just, when you were talking about uh, light yeah. and particle versus wave, um, I wonder what that might tell us about God's glory and yeah. uh, observation. Right. Does so, that, so I don't any know, thoughts? I don't know right now whether or not this thing about light that we're discovering quantum mechanics is actually the way it happens, or if God was just using a really, really good analogy. I mean, I don't know. Um, but it's clear to me that obviously, scientifically, we can see this empirically, that by looking at something inanimate, we can actually change its behavior. It goes from being a, wa uh, it goes from being a wave function to as soon as you look at it, I mean, it's not just, it's also the, 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 the two um, photons with different uh, angular momentum. As soon as you know the angular momentum of one, the other one behaves with the, as if the angular momentum is going in the opposite direction instantaneously, even though they're separated by perhaps millions and millions of miles. It's, there's no intuitive way to describe that. Yes? Gives a kind of perverse uh, uh, analogy to by beholding we become changed. Exactly. And, and so what I don't know, and see the scientists are, are right now, they're literally wringing their heads, they have no idea how to explain this. And what they have done, and, and I'm just throwing this out, I'm talking out loud, is they've all assumed that they're not the ones changing, the observer's not changing, it's the observed that's changing, right? The wave is changing from a wave function into a particle. Is it possible that maybe we're the ones that are changing? Because what, they're, what they are, what's, what the official scientific evidence is saying right now is that light knows when you look at it, and it knows before you look at it that you're going to look at it. 
light, a particle, knows that. That's pretty hard to believe. That's hard to believe. Yes. Somebody else. Um, yeah. I think uh, we have to be very careful not to uh, enter or go to in that direction of, of new age age believes, you know, that they think they, they know everything. As Stephen Hawking said, if we know the thoughts of God, so we can control the God, we'll be God. <laughs> so yeah. We don't want to do that. Exactly. Yeah. So what I'm saying, even though uh, waves or particles, is that, the, is that the final age of the science? Yeah. That could be tomorrow very wrong. For sure. sure. So, to me, it's more, more I can say, biblical way the spirit than, than than the particles or some or something else. Yeah. Uh, as we know, the uh, Satan was uh, as Lucifer was before that. He knew much more than all science. They know. They know today. Yeah. But as you mentioned, uh, quoting the the Solomon. Everything boils down to the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we should be very careful. And, and where I come at it is, um, we're, you know, we're given direction in the spirit of prophecy that the unseen, sorry, the seen can tell us about the unseen. And so I think that's where I'm coming from this in terms of nature, which is the second book, only, second only to the Bible, that we can glean from nature information about the creator and perhaps his analogies. I think it, he keeps referring to himself as light. I am the light, I am the light. And he knew that full well when he said that I am the light. He knew full well that it was gonna be read in 2017 and that we were gonna have these experiments done. And what I like to see is if he, if he did know all of that, that wouldn't it be cool if he's hid something in there? That to me is a place to hide something, is when and that's the way the Bible has worked. The Bible hasn't changed, yet our understanding of the Bible has changed dramatically because new understanding sheds new light on texts that we didn't understand before. But yes, yeah. from the scientific way, yeah. we don't know yet what is the light. Right. But for the biblical way, yes, we know that Jesus is that light. And we have to establish that relationship with him well, more and, on the spiritual. Absolutely, and what I don't know is, is Jesus, is Jesus li the light? or is Jesus like light? And that's, you see what I'm saying? So the, the way, in other words, is Christ using a really good analogy when he says, I am the light of the world? Is he saying, so I behave just like light? Yes, even in that quantum way, I behave like that. And that's just, obviously God created light, we know that, he did it on the first day. So God can't be, li God is not light. That would be kind of pantheistic, right? God created light. And if he says, hey, you know that thing I created? I'm just kind of, I'm like that. Just like, you know, the vine that I created? I'm like the vine too. You're the branches, I'm the vine. And so what I like to do is I like to, because when Christ says things about I'm like X or I'm like Y or I'm like Z, almost 100% of the time that I've looked at it, the analogy goes far deeper than we thought. It goes far deeper. And it's because our understanding of that analogy has improved over time. Like, like, for instance, we talked about how the church is a woman. Yeah, I will, I will rely more on spirit than on quantum mechanics. Yeah, well, but it's nice to get that confirmation, I, I think, because yeah. we can learn more about that, right? What Ellen White says, even she says, well, I say even she, she says, our knowledge is not done. There's, there's, far, there's many gems hidden that have yet been discovered. And he, she says that it's the second book, that nature is the second book. She didn't say, put that book away, just study on the Bible. She says, pull that book out. And look, because the seen tells us about the unseen. She says that. So I, I think I'm on safe ground doing that. Yeah. But again, it all has to boil down to Isaiah 820. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. Yes. In all the sanctuary analogies, in the sanctuary analogies, the sanctuary is just a non-living environment until the Holy Spirit comes in. Mm -hmm. When the Holy Spirit came, like in Solomon's temple, when the Holy Spirit came in, everybody had to leave because it was too bright for people to, to process. Yeah. And yet we're all like sanctuaries and we require the presence of the Holy Spirit to actuate us so that we can see and see harmoniously with what all the different things that God has placed around us. Right. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. I'm not sure where to start here. <laughs> what I what I uh, what I see here is uh, you, you bringing all these correlations together. Uh, but I, what I uh, see is uh, a path of defining terms so that the correlations do occur. Mm -hmm. And those are your definitions. For example, when you say that uh, the code. Um, DNA code is submissive, so as Jesus is submissive. You're, you're defining submissive as being the same, having the same meaning when they don't. The will of the Father. Uh, well, I know, but, but you're defining it, and what you're doing is creating that correlation by your definition. And uh, so I, I see a lot of, of that here. Um, first, uh, I, I need to mention that when you, when you uh, talk about uh, entanglement, to say that it's, there's information being fa uh, travel faster than the speed of light, that has not been proven. That, that is mostly people who write about people who do research in entanglement interpreting it in that way. Entanglement does not, there's, no, there's still no information traveled faster than the speed of light. It's not, when they do the experiment, what they do is they have detectors that look at, coral, uh, that look at spin up or spin down. And they look at, in, in one detector, it sees it as random. Mm -hmm. The other detector sees the spin up and spin down change randomly too. It's only when they bring them together, they look, they see the correlation that yes, when one goes up, the other one comes down, but they can't see it individually as separated apart. They have to bring it together in order for that correlation to be seen, in order to, to determine that yes, one is spin up and the other one spin down. And that, that means you can't, there's no information there because it's random on both detectors. It only becomes non-random when they re look at the correlations of that sequential pattern. And, and as a result, information cannot change, fa uh, move faster than the speed of light. They, they just had a, they, um, a, a group of Chinese um, investigators just did this, I think, last month. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I understand. Yeah. But, there, but to conclude that information is being sent faster than the speed of light. A actual information that can be interpreted, that has not been proven. Well, and to say that it is, is wrong. They're, they're doing that right now with computers, Q qubits. Uh, yeah, but yeah. what they're doing is taking the uh, wave uh, uh, particle duality yeah. and allowing that to uh, uh, to be a, uh, a source of, uh, of more than one, when bits are either ones or zeros. So you can create uh, uh, properties of, of particles in which they have more than just zeros and ones. Right. There's other properties, right. so it allows them to compute much faster as a result. You know, it's like uh, computing in hex rather than in, in, in bits. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, yes, that's there, but you're, you're making, you're, you're stretching a lot of things you're saying are stretching I, I, far I beyond what, 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 I, what, what I, is, is really I, legitimate to do. I understand what you're saying. I disagree with what you're saying, but I understand what you're saying. Um, when I have a DNA molecule, I don't know what else to say. I mean, there's a sense strand and there's an anti-sense strand. If I don't use the word submissive, I can say reliant on, complementary to. These are all It's words. not a scientific term that you would use. Complementary? Submission. That you describe describe what describe what's going on. Complementary. But you're you're correlating that complementary to submission, and then correlating <laughs> it to to Jesus at submission. See, you're right. defining the terms to make those correlations. And that's happen. what you have to do with analogies. Well, that's what metaphors do. That's what I mean, metaphors that's what you do. do. I know, but those those are symbols of truth. They're not truth themselves. And that's what an analogy is. Yeah. So you so. know, and that's that's the thing I'm. Uh, 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 that I wonder about too yeah. is that when you, you say you would like to be able to talk to people like Hawk, uh, uh, like um, um, Hawkins or somebody like that and be able to explain this to them. Mm. You mention the sanctuary to them, they're just going to yawn and turn their heads and go away. Because they're not detecting the light. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That's right. And, and, and the, so just, the, the, God is just a probability wave function for them. Uh, well, they don't. They don't. Yeah, they don't believe in God. So, so you're right. you're you're talking about the sanctuary. But what you can do is talk about things like the fine tuning of the universe. They listen to oh, that. There's so much stuff that you can talk about. I know, but there's a core. There, there's well, information there. There's information there. Sure, you can. Oh no. Uh, yeah. So I, I, 
I, yeah. I went to like what, 12, 15 last time? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I know, but yeah. there's, a, there's a, yeah. or you can talk about the anthropic principle. When you talk about the, <laughs> the uh, you know, the, the... But the anthropic principle and these scientific things are not, are not demonstrably seen in the Bible like the sanctuary is seen in the Bible. And, and the reason, you, and it's not like I'm making this up. God says himself, Saul, or David said himself, God, your way is in the sanctuary. All, I'm going to contemplate all of your things that you do, all of them. He wasn't, he, he really didn't limit himself there. He said everything. All your things that you do, your way is in the sanctuary. Yeah. And then, and then I see uh, the founder of, of, our, of our faith, one of the founders, the co-founders, she says that this was the key that opened up a complete system of truth. System, not a truth, not an explanation for why we were disappointed in 1844, a complete system of truth. So if I have on two authorities, in terms of what I believe, you've got a sanctuary that is opening up a complete system of truth, and on the other side, you've got a situation where everything he does is in the sanctuary. That's a code that, if, I, if this code, if the amount of times we saw this code was hitting the, the receptors at SETI, they would, their minds would be blowing up right now. You remember the wow signal, right? The wow signal was just a couple of codes in a row, and they went berserk. They thought they had found something. Pulsars so the, so, too. So, so the, the, level, the level that is obtained at SETI, the bar is very low. The bar is very low. And here what we've seen is coincidence after coincidence after coincidence after coincidence where we see the sanctuary in not only in the silo of the Bible, not only in the silo of the Seventh-day Adventist Church combining the two, but we also see, and as predicted by people thousands of years ago, that the body of Christ, which is man, it's in the shape of a man, he was a man, has one circulation system and we were baptized with one baptism. And yet we are many parts of that. And this was before cells were discovered. Yeah. So I think it's very, very but if, but predictive if you, but if and, hypo talk about, and hypothesis driven. But that's fine if you're going to talk yeah. within the Adventist church. But outside the Adventist church, your communication has to be on something they can relate to. And you can do that with the, with the uh, fine tuning, for Here's, example. It, yeah. it shows how narrow life exists. I, so uh, how narrow things have to be set up in order for life to exist is a narrow path, just like Jesus said. Okay. And, and what, what also in, in the anthropic sorry. principle, uh, uh, it, 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 if mind is involved in the reality that it results, it also means that mind has to be um, part of, uh, uh, has to be uh, uh, part of the, what's created in itself. It has to be participatory. And that relates to Jesus Christ and his, um, um, his coming to this world. Yeah. Okay, so there's ways of doing that, but well, you won't my, get there by talking about burden, the sanctuary. My burden is not in convincing uh, Richard Dawkins that Christ is coming to this planet. I mean, he's, my burden is with everyone in this church, everybody here that knows Christ and yet don't have faith because they don't know how these connections are. These are very powerful connections that are, I, I agree with you, they're not gonna work on Richard Dawkins. I didn't set this up for Richard Dawkins. This is set up for people who know Christ, who, under, who need to know the sanctuary. That's, that's who this is. What's that? Absolutely, our young people, who are just asked to believe random things without a central organizational thing. So I'm not here to prove to you or to, to Richard Dawkins that he needs to become a Seventh-day Adventist. Unfortunately, his time is going to come. Uh, and I, I have not. And you can you, you feel free to take any of this and use it um, uh, in terms of what whatever you, what, you would like. What's your website? Can you tell us what your website is? Website. Um, do I, do I, I have a website? <laughs> I, Are you open to that? I'm. I'm we'll have to get a website opened up. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. We are actually working on a website. It's called um, uh, Mordecai at the Gate. Oh. Mordecai at the Gate. And I, that, I'm that going to make a, a comment, if yes. I may, at yeah. this point. And I'm going to say that uh, the, the analogy of the cell, the human cell, to a sanctuary is stunning. Uh, that's uh, something that 
fits fairly well without having to be forced, without having to be defined into it, or at least the definitions seem to be close enough to natural that the analogy is, is really quite good. I, I mean, I, I think I wanted to show this particular slide just for that argument. Um, I mean, this, I just pull, I, the only thing I added here was this box. This was taken completely off of the internet for teaching purposes to have students understand the body fluids. And it, it, I mean, I'm not, I'm not massaging that. And then you put into the fact that Christ says we are born in, we are born in one blood and we are baptized into one baptism, all of us. You're talking about you're creating from scratch a human body. And we are all literally in the body of Christ. I, I do have a, a question. Yeah. If, if the law of God is analogous, or uh, maybe even there is a separate law of God that he has given to us as, as humans, uh, that uh, if that is, I suppose, representative of the law of God that's in the ark, remember there are two parts to the law. Mm -hmm. There's the Ten Commandments, and then there's the scroll that was in the side of the ark as well. Um, can one push that analogy any further, and can one use that to do uh, perhaps some scientific work that would not ordinarily be done? I think you have to be careful about how far you push analogies. That's always the danger with analogies. Analogies are analogies because they're not the actual thing, right? Christ, the church really isn't a woman. It's, it's a church. But, it, but the way that it's described in the scriptures is that way. So it's, it's um, I think it's, what I use it for is it's interesting to see these things in the cell, in the analogy, and say, wow, that, that fits, and it would be very hard for it not to fit. Whether it be hypothesis driving scientific experiments that you could do, I think that's an, another question. Well, but uh, the point of it is that if, if, you if could. the experiments can be done, yeah. can be driven by this kind of thing, then it makes it into a scientific theory. It's possible. I guess I'm next. Yes. Okay. Um, I think you stimulated all of our minds, and that's good. Well, then I've been successful. That's, <laughs> that's why we're here today. Uh, another thing I appreciate is that I can see a work in progress. In other words, you haven't reached finality on any aspect of the topic. And you're doing what the Bible says, and that's to go to the brethren, test an idea, you know, and you're testing. <laughs> we're we're uh, kind of the audience. And I appreciate that. Your, uh, our reaction is providing input, and I can tell you're listening carefully and so on. Uh, I'd like to just share with you something I've already shared publicly. Um, I've been asked to, my name, by the way, is Warren Johns. I've been asked to uh, teach the Sabbath school lesson various times, including last Sabbath. That's why I missed okay. your presentation last Sabbath uh, from the pulpit there at University Church across the way. Uh, about five years ago, I began sharing some sanctuary nuggets. I call them nuggets of truth. And um, in my doctoral work at Andrews, I also discovered that sanctuary has many, many related truths buried in it, including the doctrine of creation. And we're all here today because we want to explore the depths of creation. We want to understand the creator better and develop a relationship. And so I walked the people through with a diagram. It was on the screen. It was broadcast on LLBN. If the sanctuary has six articles of furniture, which basically does, if you don't count the pots and the spoons and the other things, six basic articles of furniture, as you know. Could that relate to the six days of creation? So I was presenting a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that in a wilderness setting where people were very uneducated, they were in great ignorance of God and his work and his creative power, wouldn't God give an object lesson of creation? Because they, no one was there 
to watch the Creator at work, including Adam. And the object lesson is God was walking them through the days of creation in the sanctuary. So think about this. Uh, what's the darkest part of the sanctuary? Okay, if it weren't for the Shekinah glory, it okay. would be the most holy place. Yeah. When God started, God the Creator started creation, he started with darkness and then moved to light. Light, as you pointed out, has a very central role all through scripture, including the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. and the holy city, and so on. So if you start creation day one there, then day two, what would that be? Well, you're, you're looking at the atmosphere and the, the heavens and the firmament. Uh, as you exit from the most holy place to the holy place, the first article of furniture is the ark of golden ark of incense. Right. And the incense ascends like a cloud. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew word is cloud, mm -hmm. anav or something like that. Um, so, day two, clouds, firmament, sanctuary, cloud of incense. You see where yeah. I'm going at? Yeah. You can walk your way through day six. <clears throat> You're finally out in the courtyard. Oh, by the way, day, day five, you mentioned today the golden, not the golden, the bronze. Um, the bronze sea. Bronze and they sea. call it, literally, scripture says bronze sea. Yeah. And so that would be the creatures of the sea. You know the birds, and I'm a bird watcher. You could even have birds come and land in that basin out in the wilderness and get some water. That's going a little too far, I think. <laughs> But then when you come to the uh, bronze altar, that's day six, creation of man and sacrifice of animals, creation of animals. Yeah. So the conjunction of where you have man and animals centered, day six. Now some of you are wondering, where's day seven? Where's the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a temple of time. So it's a, a sacred time that we meet. It's not objectified like the others the other parts of creation. So that's I've walked you through uh, real uh, quick, so think about it. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, the other thing you maybe think about is not only are the six days of creation uh, seen in the, in the sanctuary going backwards or coming out, yeah. but it's, it's also seen backwards. as a prophecy. If you think about the, uh, if we divide Earth's history into 6,000 years and we take the biggest event in that 1,000 years, you'll see it so the first thing that Christ did was what? Uh, created light. There's lightness and darkness. Yeah. And Adam and Eve chose between lightness and darkness. Mm -hmm. And then he separated the waters, he separated the waters uh, horizontally like this, right? Yeah. And what do we have? We had the flood in the second thousand years. Yeah. So the water, and then we had separation this way, uh, horizontally, and the dry land appeared in the mm -hmm. third. And that was when the Red Sea split. And then at the fourth day, we had the sun, moon, and stars. We had Christ, Christ John the and Baptist, the and the disciples. And then after that, everything that gets created has the breath of life in it. And that's the Holy Spirit Holy coming Spirit. back down. So you have the birds and, and the fish and, of course, the humans. And then on the sixth day, man is given dominion over the beasts. And in the 6,000th year, man once again will be given dominion over the beast. Just a footnote. I'm a librarian, by the way. Uh, J. N. Andrews back in the 1880s pr proposed this very theory and he wrote seven articles in the review yeah. with the 7,000 year theory. 7, and then of course the Sabbath yeah. is your resting and then the earth rests yeah. for 7, for 8,000. I'm not sure if Adventist scholars accept Andrews' view on that. <laughs> yeah. It's, none of this is salvational. I mean none of this uh, Every, anything I've proposed up here, you don't have to believe this to be saved, okay? Um, fortunately, please don't let me get to a position where that's the case. This is simply looking at how things, I always, I'm always interested in how things come together, and um, I think the sanctuary is one of those keys. Yeah. yeah, patterns are very powerful. This is what we look for. Well, again, thank you very much for coming. And I thank you for, for all of your comments and, and also gives me food for thought to look on the, yeah. thank you.